Hi, guys. Mm-hmm. 
back. Okay, the topic today is vitamins. Um, before we start, I want to let you know I'm still waiting on one midterm exam to come in. That's why I haven't posted yet. So I've got all your scores. I'm just holding steady until uh, I get that submission. Now, um, vitamins are critical to our health because they serve as tools to help enzymes do their jobs. And remember that an enzyme is just a protein that helps the chemical reaction happen quickly enough that our cells and tissues can use what that reaction makes in order to keep the cell alive, right? So it's just a way to speed everything up, okay? Now, a simple enzyme is just a, an enzyme that only has a protein part. There are some enzymes that are just protein. But a lot of enzymes use tools to help them do their job. We call those tools cofactors, okay? And they come from either vitamins or minerals, okay? Oh, my God. Cofactors can be metal ions or tiny molecules. And a coenzyme is just a cofactor that is an organic molecule. And that's going to come from a vitamin that's in your diet. Okay. So remember that there's two classes of vitamins, right? There's fat soluble vitamins and there's, there's water soluble vitamins, right? And a fat soluble vitamin is one that can dissolve in lipid and a water soluble vitamin can dissolve in water okay vitamins are organic substances that are required for enzymatic reactions if we didn't have these then those chemical reactions would happen so slowly that we wouldn't get any value out of them there's 13 essential vitamins they have special functions, and the two classes are shown here, right? Vitamin C and B complex, and the fat-soluble vitamins A, D, E, and K, okay? Vitamins by themselves aren't used to generate energy, but vitamins are tools that are used to create the energy that we need, okay? So you can see some different types of cofactors, right? If it's a protein only, we just think of it as a simple enzyme, it's a protein and a metal ion, that would be an enzyme plus a cofactor. Or if it's a protein plus an organic molecule that comes from a vitamin, that would be an enzyme plus a cofactor, right? So these enzymes that need these cofactors, if they didn't have them, right, then it would be like, if you were a plumber and you showed up to a house with a leak and you didn't have any of your tools, right? 
you wouldn't do much good. You could probably identify the leak and talk about it, but you couldn't fix it. Okay. So it's the same way with these cofactors, right? You can see how a coenzyme can work, right? A coenzyme can come into the active site and make it take on the correct shape to bind the target molecules, which are the, the substrates. Those are the reactants, the things that are going to get together to make the products, right? And then we can release the products and then the coenzyme can circle back and be used again, okay? So that's the value, again, of having this in your diet, right? You let those reactions happen. And when you don't have them in your diet, you end up with deficiency diseases that we'll talk about, right? There are diseases that are the result of too little vitamin C or too little vitamin D or too little vitamin B, okay? The B12 vitamins, the, the, the B complex vitamins have diseases that are associated with not having enough of them in your diet, okay? So you can see in the table below here, the different vitamins, water-soluble vitamins are listed here, right? What they are when they're a coenzyme, they usually get chemically modified before they pony up with an enzyme and start to do their work. And then their function is shown over here, all right? So you might wonder, you know, what is it that these, these cofactors are helping us do, right? Well, thiamine helps with um, something called decarboxylation. Well, what is that? That's removing a CO2 group from a molecule, okay? Stripping it off. Riboflavin helps us move high energy electrons from one molecule to another, okay? And the reason that that's important is because that's a big part of what helps us make ATP in the mitochondria. Oxidation reduction is what niacin helps us do. So it's very similar to what riboflavin does. We're moving electrons from one molecule to another. And the result of that is that you're able now to get energy out of those molecules and that helps you to make ATP, right? And that's the form of energy that allows us to do all the work in the cell, right? If we can't make the ATP, then we have trouble doing anything, right? Doing any kind of work. So very important vitamin there, okay? And then you've got, whoops, sorry, down here, vitamin B5, right? And that's for acetyl group transfer. Well, what is that? An, an acetyl group is just like a, a real short um, acid group, okay? The, the chemical group looks like this, okay, acetyl group. Got a little CH3 hanging off of it. And it just lifts that from one molecule and slaps it onto another. Okay. In transamination, all right, we're moving an amino group from one molecule to another. Okay. NH3. In methyl group transfer, we're, we're taking a CH3 group and moving it from one molecule to another. Vitamin C helps with the production of collagen, which is important in bone structure and the integrity of your skin, among other things. And then biotin is important in carboxylation. And again, you might say, well, what is that? Well, that's taking basically a, a CO2 group, okay, and adding that to a molecule, okay? So it'll, it'll steal it from one place and it'll add it somewhere else, 
And then finally, down here, folic acid is also for moving around methyl groups. Okay. So that's what they're doing chemically, right? They're just, they're lifting stuff up and moving it around, or in the case of electron transfer or oxidation reduction, they're moving electrons from one place to another. And when that happens, they are able to get the energy out. Okay. The fat soluble vitamins are A, D, E, and K, and they dissolve in lipid, but not in water. So they're mostly carbon and hydrogen, right? They're important for vision, bone formation, there are antioxidants, and they're important in blood clotting. And we store these in our body, in our body fat, okay? So it's possible with these kind of vitamins to, to get an overdose, right? You can OD on these, right? Because they are stored in fat. Stored in fat. So it's possible to take too much of these. Okay. With the water soluble vitamins, that won't happen because the extra vitamins will just end up leaving you in your pee. Okay. Your kidneys will clear them out. So vitamin A is important for helping us see. Right. It's also important for the development of certain layers of our skin. OK. This is what becomes a, a molecule called retinol in our retina. And that's part of what makes us able to take light that bounces off an object and turn that into an electrical signal that we can pipe back to the brain and interpret as vision. OK. Vitamin D is important for absorbing calcium and phosphate. So it's a bone builder, okay? Vitamin E is an antioxidant. And so what happens here is it prevents the loss of electrons from molecules that need to hold on to them, okay? In this case, the oxidation is damaging because it breaks down the molecules that it happens to and it ruins their function. So vitamin E keeps that from happening. Vitamin K is important in blood clotting, okay? Now, one source of vitamins that you probably don't think about is the bacteria that live in your colon, right? E. coli populate your large intestine, and part of what they do when they feed off your waste products is that they make vitamin K and B-complex vitamins that we can absorb across the lining of the large intestine into the blood and use for those different roles, right? So that's a symbiotic relationship between our body and the bacteria that live in our colon, okay? But most of the vitamins that we get come from our diet or come from supplements, okay? So let's take a look at how some of these vitamins work. This is a look at the B vitamin. This animation demonstrates how B vitamin coenzymes must be present in order to enable some enzymes to carry out their functions. Many of the B vitamins assist in the complex biochemical processes that produce energy from food. The B vitamins are essential parts of coenzymes. Coenzymes are part of the machinery that allows reactions to take place. Enzymes are large protein molecules that catalyze biochemical reactions by lowering activation energies. Enzymes accomplish catalysis by configuring chemical reactants in the best possible spatial arrangement for reactivity. This enzyme catalyzes the release of carbon dioxide when producing energy from carbohydrates. Combining with the coenzyme helps the inactive enzyme achieve the appropriate three-dimensional configuration. For this reaction, thiamine must be present as the coenzyme. The green coenzyme molecule above is thiamine pyrophosphate, 
the cofactor needed to permit the enzyme and the substrate, pyruvate, to combine in the correct orientation to catalyze the reaction. Now all three molecules are nested together, and the substrate, pyruvate, combines chemically with the coenzyme, thiamine. The biochemical reaction can take place and energy, as ATP, and CO2 are produced as products of the reaction. Once this happens, the remaining complex, containing the two-carbon fragment, thiamine, and the apoenzyme, rearranges and releases the two-carbon fragment, acetaldehyde, and the ATP. The departure of the acetaldehyde opened the thiamine pyrophosphate to combine with another molecule of pyruvate, and the cycle continues. Meanwhile, the energy is now in the molecule ATP and is available to do work or to be stored. Another way that a coenzyme can influence the reaction between substrate and enzyme is to cause a change in configuration of the enzyme without interacting with the substrate. Here you see the conformational change in the enzyme needed to configure the enzyme to accept the substrate in a lock and key complex. This is called an allosteric control. The cofactor approaches the inactive enzyme and bonds to it in an enzyme-coenzyme complex. The new configuration is a good fit for the substrate. Once this enzyme-cofactor substrate complex is formed, energy can be released as ATP, and the other reaction products can be released from the complex. Now the correctly configured active site on the enzyme is free to engage another substrate. The amount of B vitamins that are needed to serve as coenzymes is quite small. There is enough thiamine activity in 1.2 milligrams to meet the average person's needs all day. Extra B vitamins will not produce more energy. Excess B vitamins in the body will pass out of the kidneys into the urine. This table shows some details about several of the roles played by B vitamins as coenzymes. Okay, I've posted in chat the notes. And this animation demonstrates how B vitamins... And the homework. Okay, so go to chat and download that. If you see it, I'm also going to send it to you in an email in just a moment. Now, thiamine is also called vitamin B1 because it was the first B vitamin that we discovered, right? It helps in energy metabolism and muscle action and nerve function. And if we don't have enough of it, we have a condition called beriberia. And when we have beriberi, we see ataxia, which is inability to properly move, confusion, anorexia, tachycardia, which is rapid heartbeat, headache, weight loss, and fatigue, which is being tired all the time. This is part of the coenzyme thiamine pyrophosphate, and it's a decarboxylating cofactor, right? So this helps to move CO2 groups away from molecules called keto acids. Just know that it strips off CO2 groups. And when it does that, energy comes out. And we can use that energy to make ATP. Recommended daily allowance is two milligrams. Too little is going to cause fatigue, poor appetite, weight loss, nerve degeneration, and heart failure. And the sources are liver, yeast, whole grains, cereals, and milk, okay? And you can see, again, um, how the vitamin gets changed into the cofactor down below, right? We basically put some phosphate groups on it, and then it's ready. And then this acts just like a, a lever arm that takes CO2 groups and takes them, strips them right off of a molecule and when that happens energy comes out okay so let me uh i want to show you a little bit about berry berry here so hold on
Hey guys, it's Medicosis. Okay. Let's do another share. Hey guys, it's Medicosis Perfectionalis, where medicine makes perfect sense. Today we'll continue our biochemistry playlist. Please watch these videos in order. Let's talk about beriberi or vitamin B1 deficiency. It all started in the 19th century when Dr. Takaki Kanehiro discovered that sailors who ate only white rice developed some symptoms, but sailors who had a balanced diet did not develop the symptoms. And when he digged deeper, he discovered the symptoms of thiamine deficiency, also known as vitamin B1 deficiency, which happens to you if you only eat white rice, because as you know, white rice is deficient in thiamine. And thanks to Dr. Takaki, we call beriberi kake. Kake is the same thing as beriberi. Something that 99% of your professors simply do not know. Vitamins are called vitamins because we thought that they were vital amines, but they are not. They are organic molecules, micronutrients, and they are essential, which means your body cannot make them. Therefore, you have to eat them in your diet. We divide them into water-soluble and fat-soluble. Vitamin B1 is here. It's a water-soluble vitamin. Therefore, deficiency is more likely. Vitamin B complex include eight individuals. And by the way, B looks like an eight. And here is the names. The most common cause of vitamin B1 deficiency worldwide is eating white refined rice that's not fortified or enriched with vitamin B1. Vitamin B1 deficiency is a cofactor for transketolase. That's why you can measure the vitamin B1 level by measuring the RBC transketolase activity. If you have vitamin B1 deficiency, bad things can happen, include wernicke korsakoff syndrome, thiamine metabolism dysfunction syndromes, which include two, and beriberi, which can be divided into infantile and adult. Adult is divided into wet, dry, and gastrointestinal. Very, very infantile or adult. The adult, wet, dry, or gastrointestinal. Wet include CHF and edema. Dry is neuropathy. Gastrointestinal is lactic acidosis, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, etc., and including abdominal cramping. We have talked about infantile beriberi in a previous video, but in brief, two to three months old, when the baby is breastfed, if mommy is thiamine deficient, or if the formula does not contain thiamine, as you know. Symptoms include cardiomegaly, the big heart, tachycardia, cyanosis, vomiting, high-pitched cry, nystagmus, and seizure shaking treatment. The baby has no thiamine. Give the baby thiamine. And I've talked about this sad story in my previous video about infantile beriberi in this biochemistry playlist. Infantile beriberi, high-pitched cry, vomiting, cardiomegaly, tachycardia, nystagmus, seizure, cyanosis, and edema. Thiamine deficiency is one of the causes of a reversible intellectual disability. Causes of thiamine deficiency are numerous, including alcoholism and malnutrition. Please do not forget these two. Folate deficiency can lead to thiamine deficiency. Here is an example of a vitamin deficiency leading to another vitamin deficiency. Other causes of beriberi, these are controversial. I'll leave you to read them. We are done with infantile. Let's talk about adult beriberi. Adult beriberi, dry and wet and gastrointestinal dry. Peripheral neuropathy, it's symmetrical, it's distal, it's sensory and motor. Wet, cardiomyopathy, specifically dilated cardiomyopathy and cardiomegaly. CHF will lead to edema that's pitting bilateral and it's a transudate, not an exudate. Increased heart rate called tachycardia. Neuropathy can happen with the, with the wet subtype as well. Let's get more sophisticated. Adult beriberi, dry and wet. Dry, neuropathy, why? Due to demyelination. The neuropathy is symmetrical, distal, sensory, and motor. When it's distal, it's hard. Stand up from a squatting position. The sensory includes sensory loss, 
pain and suffering, I'm sorry, as well as sensory ataxia, the motor is weakness. There is decreased reflexes. Of course, it's symmetrical. If you have nerve problem, you'll have muscle problem. This is symmetrical muscle wasting. You can also get nystagmus and vomiting and look at this loss of myelin called demyelination. Let's talk about the wet subtype. Usually starts three months after being thiamine deficient. Cardiomyopathy, specifically dilated cardiomyopathy and cardiomegaly. The cardiac muscle basically lacks ATP. Why? Because your pyruvate dehydrogenase enzyme is not working. Also, your alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase is not working, etc., etc., etc. There is biventricular failure leading to CHF, which is congestive heart failure. You'll have congestion, which will lead to edema, dependent bilateral pitting edema, which is a transudate. This will happen due to right sided heart failure. But since we establish it's a biventricular failure, also the left side will fail. When the left side fails, you get lung problems, dyspnea, PND, which is paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, and cardiogenic pulmonary edema. You will hear crackles on auscultation of the chest. There is increased heart rate, high output of cardiac failure. Everything is fast, everything is dilated, everything is distended, including your jugular vein. How do you diagnose beriberi? Easy. You will see vitamin deficiency, literally increased lactic acid because of the problems in the pyruvate dehydrogenase. Now the pyruvate will be converted into lactate. Lactic acid will lead to lactic acidosis, which is a high anion gap metabolic acidosis. The anion gap is greater than 12. Also, there is decreased RBC transketolase activity because transketolase is dependent on vitamin B1 as a cofactor. Treatment, if the baby lacks thiamine, give the baby thiamine. Same thing with adults. Infantile, check. Wet, check. Dry, check. Let's talk about gastrointestinal. Here's the plan. Pyruvate normally is converted into acetyl-CoA if you have the pyruvate dehydrogenase. This pyruvate dehydrogenase requires vitamin B1 as a cofactor. If you have vitamin B1 deficiency, you will not have pyruvate dehydrogenase. Pyruvate cannot become acetyl-CoA. Pyruvate will go into the ugly path of lactic acid, which will lead to lactic acidosis, which will cause high anion gap metabolic acidosis which means that your pH is low, your bicarbonate is low, that's why it's a metabolic acidosis and your anion gap is high. As you know, the pyruvate dehydrogenase enzyme requires five cofactors, including thiamine. Deficiency in any of these five cofactors can cause lactic acidosis. Here is gastrointestinal beriberi. The idea is that you are deficient in thiamine, therefore pyruvate dehydrogenase cannot work. Pyruvate will become lactate instead of acetyl-CoA, which will lead to lactic acidosis and hagma. Lactic acidosis will lead to cramping. That's why when you go to the gym, sometimes you feel muscle cramps. The cramps are the lactic freaking acid. Here the cramps are in the abdomen, so you get abdominal pain. The vagus nerve gets stimulated. This is not Las Vegas. This is the 10th cranial nerve. Get your head out of your sphincter, which will lead to nausea and vomiting. Here are some causes of edema of nutritional origin. These are the causes of high output cardiac failure, also known as hyperdynamic circulation. Remember that everything is fast, everything is dilated, everything is distended, including your jugular vein. Cardiac output is high, that's why we call it high output cardiac failure. Duh! Pulmonary capillary wedge pressure is low because the cardiac muscle itself is kind of okay. TPR or the total peripheral resistance is low because everything is dilated, everything is distended. You can hear a systolic flow murmur because it's a hyperdynamic circulation. Flow murmurs are never diastolic. For instance, in a pregnant mother, it's very common to hear a systolic flow murmur. But if you hear a diastolic murmur, that's not normal. Get your head out of your gluteal region. Different classifications. Here's the classification that I like. Some people say thiamine deficiency equals very, very period. And therefore, they consider Wernicke-Korsakoff syndrome as a subtype of beriberi. And here's the terrible mnemonic that some students use. Horrible stuff. If you want better mnemonics, check out PICMonic. It's an audio-visual platform that has great medical mnemonics. It's just amazing. They are not a sponsor of this video, although they should be. Thank you so, so much for watching. Please subscribe, hit the bell, and click on the join button to literally join the tribe. Please follow me on all of these platforms. You can support this channel on Patreon or PayPal. 
Thank you for watching. As always, be safe, stay happy, and study hard. Don't forget to get my antibiotics course. Thank you for watching. This is Medicosis Perfectionalis, where medicine makes perfect sense. Hey guys, it's Medicosis Perfectionalis. Okay. All right. I sent you guys in the email the outline for this lecture and also the homework. Okay. So in addition to it being in the chat, it's also now in your email. Okay. Okay. Riboflavin, which is vitamin B2, because it was the second B vitamin discovered, is going to help us release energy from cells by helping us move high energy electrons from one location to another. And when we do that, the energy that we can strip out is used to make ATP. Okay? It's important for good vision and healthy skin. Too little of this results in chelosis, which are scales and cracks on the lips and in the corners of the mouth. A smooth or swollen red tongue, also called glossitis. Glossitis literally means inflammation of the tongue and dermatitis of the ears, the nose, and the mouth. Recommended daily allowance is 1.7 milligrams. Too little, we see dermatitis, dry skin, inflammation of the tongue, and cataracts. Sources include liver, chicken, eggs, green leafy vegetables, dairy foods, peanuts, and whole grains, okay? And so that's the that's the business end of the molecule. That's the one that can grab electrons from one molecule and dump them off to somewhere else. Okay? They kind of live the electrons in these rings here. Okay. And they are going to be a cofactor along with an enzyme that helps that to happen. Okay. Niacin is part of the coenzyme nicotinamid adenine dinucleotide, or it's often abbreviated NAD. And it's similar to um, B2 in that its job is to move high energy electrons from one molecule to another, okay? The recommended daily allowance is 13 to 18 milligrams. And too little of this, you're gonna see dermatitis, muscle fatigue, and loss of appetite, it's a condition known as pellagra, okay? Where do we get niacin? We get it from brewer's yeast, we get it from chicken, beef, fish, liver, brown rice, and also whole grains, okay? So let's take a look at pellagra. Hey, it's Medicosis Perfect Channels, where medicine just makes perfect sense. We continue our discussion on biochemistry playlists. In the previous video, I've talked about vitamin B3. Today, we'll talk about vitamin B3 deficiency, pellagra, baby. You know that vitamins aid in metabolism and they are cofactors. Vitamin B3 or niacin is water soluble, therefore, deficiency is more likely, and pellagra is more likely than vitamin B3 toxicity. B3 is the same as niacin, the same as nicotinic acid or nicotinamide. Niacin has two functions. At a lower dose, it's a vitamin. At a higher dose, it's a lipid-lowering agent. Many governments now fortify their bread with niacin or vitamin B3. That's one of the reasons pellagra is very rare nowadays. Tryptophan can become myosin, can also become serotonin. That's why patients with carcinoid syndrome, tryptophan is being converted to serotonin all the time. And we have wasted all of the tryptophan on the serotonin. We don't have any more tryptophan to produce niacin. Hashtag niacin deficiency. Hashtag pellagra. Vitamin B3 is crucial for reduction oxidation reactions, the oxyreductases. Vitamin B3, direct benefits, indirect benefits, direct benefits. It can treat pellagra, it can treat hyperlipidemia. Indirect, cofactor for reduction oxidation reactions, especially the NAD and the NAD people. Where did they come from? From niacin, this is important for catabolic reactions. This is important for anabolic reactions. 
niacin or B3 sources, natural and artificial. We have talked about this before. Remember that the most common cause of pellagra is eating only a corn-based diet because a corn-based diet is deficient of niacin and tryptophan. Niacin, nicotinamide, tryptophan enter into the mitochondria and now we have NAD and NADP. Please watch my previous videos. Absorption of niacin was discussed before. Remember that these three enzymes require five cofactors. NAD is here. It comes from vitamin B3. Niacin will give us NAD and NADP. These are really important for metabolism, which is an active process. Therefore, metabolically active cells are the most affected. The more metabolically active you are, the more affected you are with vitamin B deficiency. And where are the metabolically active cells? In the GI and skin, because this is rapid cell turnover, and in the brain, because it has high energy requirement. And that's why the symptoms of pellagra are diarrhea, dermatitis, and dementia. Medicine makes perfect sense with medicosis perfectionalis. To learn more about all of these enzymes, please watch my previous video. As you know, NAD and NADP are important for DNA repair. Therefore, when you have pellagra or niacin deficiency, do you think your skin can repair itself? No. Hashtag dermatitis. Do you think your GI can repair itself? No. Hashtag diarrhea. Do you think your brain will have its high energy requirement? Forget it. Hashtag dementia. Whether you eat carbohydrate, fat, or protein, they end up as acetyl-CoA. Enter into the TCA cycle. We need NAD to become NADH. And then we'll take this age, hashtag proton pumping, to convert ADP into ATP in the electron transport chain. If you don't have niacin, you don't have the step, and you don't have energy production in the ATC. The role of NADH in the electron transport chain was discussed in the previous video. Pelagra literally means raw skin. Pella from pellis is skin in Latin, I believe. And agra means seized. Remember podagra in gout? The big toe is seized. Isn't that doozy? Here is the most important slide in this freaking video. What are the causes of pellagra? Primary causes, secondary causes. What do you mean by primary? There is a decreased intake of vitamin B3. What do you mean by secondary? The intake is okay, but there is decreased absorption or there is an inborn error of metabolism that's messing up the stuff. Okay, primary causes, decreased intake of what? Of niacin and of tryptophan. Remember, no cash, no problem. No tryptophan, no niacin. Example, malnutrition. And my mnemonic is three A's abject poverty, alcoholism, and anorexia. And then the secondary normal intake but decreased absorption. Give me examples. Could be a malabsorption syndrome such as inflammatory bowel disease, celiac disease, and malignancy, short bowel syndrome, etc. Tumors such as carcinoid syndrome because we are consuming all of the tryptophan to make serotonin and not niacin. Heart knob disease. There's an inborn error of metabolism. We cannot reabsorb the neutral amino acids such as tryptophan, no tryptophan, no niacin. Bariatric surgery, dialysis, and drugs such as isoniazid, especially long term use. 5 FU, FU back pyrazinamide, 6 mercaptopurine, and phenytoin. Carcinoid syndrome, what's the problem here? The problem is that all of my tryptophan has been converted into serotonin, therefore I have lots of serotonin and lots of 5-HIAA in the urine, hydroxyindoleacetic acid, but I have less tryptophan being converted to niacin because all of it has been consumed in this path and not this path. Therefore, I'll end up with vitamin deficiency, hashtag pellagra, diarrhea, dermatitis, dementia. This was the story of carcinoid syndrome. Other causes of pellagra include isoniazid. Isoniazid can cause pellagra by two mechanisms. Number one, it can inhibit a vitamin B6. Of course, it causes vitamin B6 deficiency. No vitamin D6, no NADPH. Great. Isoniazid can also lead to decreased pyridoxal phosphate, the famous PLP. With no PLP, no tryptophan. Of course, no tryptophan, no niacin, no sauce, no problem. I heard that one day in a Taco Bell. Tryptophan to niacin. There are many drugs that can inhibit the conversion of tryptophan to niacin. And when you inhibit the conversion of tryptophan to niacin, this is called pellagra. What are these drugs? Isoniazid, of course, we have talked about that before. 5-fluorouracil, the famous chemotherapeutic agent. 
pyrazinamide, the famous anti-tuberculous medication, anti-TB. Also, isoniazid is anti-TB. Phenytoin is anti-seizure, 6 mercaptopurine and azathioprine. These are immunosuppressant. Chloramphenicol is the famous or the infamous antibiotic that can cause gray baby syndrome. That's why the color here is gray. What are other side effects of pyrazinamide? Hyperuricemia. 5-fluorouracil, 6-mercaptopurine, and azathioprine, all of them can lead to bone marrow suppression and increase your risk of infection. Chloramphenicol, isoniazid, and pyrazinamide were discussed in detail in my premium course called Antibiotics, available on my website, medicosisperfectionalist.com. My antibiotics course is on sale now until the end of the month on my website, medicosisperfectionalist.com. Heart node disease, an inborn error of metabolism. Is it inherited or acquired? It's inherited. It's congenital. It's autosomal recessive. There's decreased carrier protein of neutral amino acids in the kidney and GI. You cannot absorb or reabsorb neutral amino acids such as tryptophan. No tryptophan, no niacin. Hashtag Allegra. Diarrhea, dermatitis, dementia, and eventually death. Diagnosis, increase urine level of neutral amino acid because you cannot reabsorb them. They are lost in the pee. And treatment is, if the patient has no niacin, give the patient niacin. If the patient has no tryptophan, give the patient tryptophan. A lot of it. Vitamin B3 deficiency, prevalence, wherever there is, abject poverty, alcoholism, strict reliance on corn, Africa, China, India, and rural South America, at least in the past. As people today are getting slightly better nutrition, Compared to the past, we are seeing less and less pellagra. Symptoms, diarrhea, vomiting, dermatitis, dementia, and diarrhea, dermatitis, dementia, and eventually death, the four famous days. Also, you can have disorientation and delusion. Stomatitis can happen with B3 or B2 deficiency. Inflammation of the mouth, glossitis, red tongue. The way I remember the patient on my exam, if they say the patient came from a very poor country, the problem is probably malnutrition. If the patient came from a very rich country, from a very rich family, and he or she has pellagra, it's probably alcoholism. How do you diagnose pellagra? History and physical, the patient is malnourished. You, you, like A good doctor is a good observer. Alcoholic, a good doctor is a good observer. Anorexic, carcinoid, and heart nut or medications. That's why medication is part of the history. Family history is part of the patient's history. How to diagnose it by using labs? We can try urine. You will have decreased urine level of N-methylnicotinamide, that's another niacin, decreased level of 2-pyridone over N-methylniacinamide ratio. In the serum, you'll find decreased N-methylnicotinamide. In the red blood cells, you can measure something called the erythrocyte NAD over NADP ratio. How do you treat the patient? If the patient has no niacin, give the patient niacin. And of course, correct the underlying cause if you can. Clinical pearls, stomatitis can happen with vitamin B2 deficiency or vitamin B3 deficiency. That's why we call this pellagra and we call this pellagra sign pellagra, which means pellagra without pellagra. It's like decaffeinated coffee. The most common cause of thiamine deficiency is eating a strict diet of white refined rice or bread. The most common cause of niacin deficiency or pellagra is eating a strict diet of corn-based food. Medicosis in the kitchen and throughout history, how tortillas saved Latin America from pellagra. Are you kidding me? Actually, I'm not. If you look at grains, they have something called niacin or niacetin. Niacetin is a freaking protein and it's a source of niacin in the grains. However, it's not available. The bioavailability sucks because it's bound to a complex and this complex is called hemicellulose. Hemicellulose is bound to a niacetin and they form a complex. You cannot easily absorb it. So how can we re release niacetin from the bondage of the hemicellulose? Easy. Soak the grain and cook the grain in an alkaline solution. They call this process nixtamalization. Who named these things? And this nixtamalization is how you make tortillas. And this is common in Mexico, Central America, South America, and among the native peoples of the Americas. I think I'm now an expert on Mexican food. I should open a restaurant called Medicosis Tortillas. No pelagra, no problema. Please forgive my stupid jokes. Medicosis beyond medicine. Pellagra in humans will give you a red tongue, but pellagra in puppies will give you a black tongue. My knowledge extends beyond medicine, man. From tomorrow morning, I should ditch Gray's anatomy and start reading about the anatomy of the donkey. 
Why does pellagra cause diarrhea and dermatitis dementia? Because the metabolically active cells are the most affected because now they do not have NAD or NADP. In the next video, we'll talk about a mnemonic about vitamin B3, and then we'll talk about vitamins in a nutshell, a quick review of vitamin B3. These are some pearls for you. Please pause and read. Also, my cardiac pharmacology is heavily discounted right now. You can get a free sample. And until the end of March, you can get a 50% discount. Use the promo code CARDIOFARM50. This is just available for a few days. Thank you so much for watching. Please subscribe, hit the bell, and click on the join button. You can support me here or here. Thank you for watching. As always, be safe, stay happy, and study hard. This is Medicosis Perfectionators, where medicine makes perfect sense. It's Last vitamin we're talking about before the break is panathenic acid. It's part of coenzyme A and it's needed for energy production. Also metabolism of carbohydrates, fats, proteins, and cholesterol production. Recommended daily allowance is 10 milligrams. Too little, you see fatigue, reduced growth, cramps, anemia, and body system failure. And where do we get it? Salmon, meat, eggs, whole grains, and vegetables, okay? All right, let's break here and come back at 1140.
Okay. We are back. All right. So our next vitamin is something called pyridoxin. Vitamin B6 is converted to something called PLP inside the body. And what this does is it moves amino groups around. Okay. So the idea here is to take an amino group and either remove it and maybe throw it away or remove it and um, attach it to another molecule, okay? This is important in the body, for instance, when you wanna turn amino acids, which are the building blocks of proteins into what are called keto acids, which can be used in the Krebs cycle, which is part of what makes ATP for us, okay? So you see how B6 would be pretty important. A high intake of, sub, of this supplement can cause sensory neuropathy, okay? The recommended daily allowance is a milligram. Too little can lead to dermatitis, fatigue, central nervous system disturbance, and macrocytic anemia. Okay, now you might say, what's macrocytic anemia? The, the red blood cells are larger than they should be, but there's fewer of them. And so you can't carry as much oxygen in the blood, okay? Sources are meat, liver, fish, nuts, whole grains, and spinach. This is biotin. It's a coenzyme that's used in fatty acid production, in amino acid metabolism, and in making glucose. Deficiency of this is rare, but can result in depression and fatigue as well as hair loss and a scaly red rash. Widespread food sources include eggs and milk and dark green vegetables. Okay. Now, this is a pretty crazy looking one. This is vitamin B12, all right? It consists of four pyrrole rings. You might say, what the heck is a pyrrole ring? Well, if we look here at the laser pointer, Okay, you'll see, see where each of these nitrogens are on this cobalt, right? That there is a pyrrole ring. That there is a pyrrole ring. That's a pyrrole ring and so on, okay? So four pyrrole rings with a, a cobalt ion in the middle. And it's an enzyme that helps us move methyl groups from one molecule to another. It's important in DNA production. And so that's why it's important in making red blood cells because the, the cells that generate red blood cells, the hematopoietic stem cells are rapidly dividing. And so they need to make a lot of DNA in order for them to make a lot of red blood cells. Even though your red blood cells don't have a nucleus and don't have DNA in them, the things that produce them do right? And so if we don't have a nucleus with DNA in it, because we don't have enough B12, then we can't make your red blood cells. The recommended daily allowance is three micrograms. Too little results in a condition called pernicious anemia, can also lead to nerve damage, and the red blood cells are going to be uh, improperly shaped, and they won't be able to do their job very well, because they won't have uh, there won't be enough of them, and they won't have, as a result, there won't be enough hemoglobin in the blood to do the work. Where do we get it? Liver, beef, kidney, chicken, fish, and milk products. Okay. Vitamin C is important in making collagen and in wound healing. Vitamin C helps in tissue building and in metabolism. It also helps with immune function and iron absorption. Recommended daily allowance is 60 milligrams. Too little results in scurvy, weak connective tissue, slow healing wounds, and anemia. Stress and illness, as well as cigarette smoking, increases the need for vitamin C. Cigarette smokers are advised to increase vitamin C intake to 35 milligrams daily as a result of increased oxidative stress 
and metabolic turnover. Basically, the cigarette smoke causes oxidative damage to the tissues. And so you increase the vitamin C, you reduce that effect. Where do we get it? Well, citrus fruits, right? As well as blueberries, tomatoes, peppers, broccoli, and red and green vegetables, okay? I know it sounds a little weird, but um, there's a lot of vitamin C in spinach, okay? So let's take a look at what scurvy is all about. This was a common problem, scurvy, on board uh, ships way back in colonial times. When we didn't have planes and trains, the way that we got goods around the world was to put them on board ship and send the ships across the oceans. And they were hard to staff because being on board ship back then was awful. So what the captains and the first mates would, would generally do is they would pull into port and then they would buy the local alcoholics all the drinks that they could handle. And then those people that they got drunk would wake up the next morning on board ship. They had been drafted against their will. And one of the problems that they had on these long voyages was that the, uh, the crew would have bleeding gums and and easy bruising, um, and they would have uh, problems with, with bone formation. And of course that reduced their effectiveness as a crew, right? And so they eventually figured out that this is because there wasn't any vitamin C in their diet. Vitamin C was critical for proper collagen production. And so what they would do is pack the hull with limes, right? And so that's where the term scurvy knave and limey bastard came from that you probably hear when you when you listen to the Pirates of the Caribbean movies or if you've ever seen uh, a swashbuckler epic, okay? That's where those terms originate. Now, folate, also known as PABA, right, or paraminobenzoic acid, is important in hemoglobin and amino acid production as well as new cell synthesis and prevention of neural tube defects while you're still in the uterus. It forms the coenzyme tetrahydrofolate and is used to move methyl groups around from molecule to molecule. And so it's important in the production of nucleic acids, DNA, RNA, and so on. The recommended daily allowance is 0.4 milligrams. Too little results in abnormal red blood cells, which we call megablastic anemia. Megablastic means that um, the cells are larger than they should be, okay? CNS disturbances and fetal neural tube defects, as well as poor growth. So when we say neural tube defects, what do we mean? We mean stuff like spina bifida or anencephaly, okay? In spina bifida, the baby's born with the, uh, the spinal cord and the meninges outside the body. And this usually has to be treated surgically to avoid infection and paralysis. And often that's unsuccessful. Um, another condition that goes with this is cleft palate where there's an opening in the hard palate of the mouth. And so the nose and the mouth are one chamber that has to be surgically corrected so that the baby doesn't have 
failure to thrive. And anencephaly is, is a baby born without a brain. Okay, so this has been linked to a lack of folate in the diets of the mothers. So we try to make sure that they always have adequate folate when they're pregnant. Sources are green leafy vegetables, beans, meat, seafood, yeast, asparagus, and whole grains enriched with folic acid. So this is from your textbook. These are the water-soluble vitamins. You can see what they do and where they come from and what happens if you have too little of the vitamin in your diet, okay? So this is sort of an important slide, okay? You can find this in the PDF that's your textbook, but uh, you can also find it in the presentation. So I would star this. This is good test material, okay? So make sure and take a note of that, all right? Our next vitamin is vitamin A. Right? Vitamin A you get from your orange and your yellow vegetables. It's also known, uh, it's it, the thing that produces vitamin A is called beta carotene, okay? And the name should tell you one of the sources of beta carotene, come from carrots, okay? So this is gonna be converted in the body into retinol, okay? And what is retinol? Retinol is a, um, a cofactor that helps photoreceptors in the retina turn light into electrical information that our brain interprets as vision. Okay, so you probably remember when you were little, your mom would tell you, eat your carrots so that you would have good vision, okay? And she wasn't pulling your leg. Actually, if you've ever smelled a vial of vitamin A, it smells like a bunch of carrots, okay? Recommended daily allowance is three milligrams. Too little will have you with night blindness, repressed immune system function, GI disturbance, hyperkeratosis, and slowed growth. What's hyperkeratosis? That's the building up of uh, keratinized areas on the surface of the skin, okay? It's important that you don't wanna to give too much to pregnant mothers because this is a fat soluble vitamin, right? A, D, E, and K are the fat solubles. This is our first fat soluble vitamin in this lecture. And because of that, it can accumulate. It can be toxic, right? So if you give too much to the mother, it can serve as a teratogen, okay? What is a teratogen? A teratogen is something that makes birth defects, right? Where do we get vitamin A? our orange and yellow vegetables, okay? And a lot of our green fruits and vegetables as well, okay? Vitamin D, get this from dairy, but also from the action of sunlight on our skin and the proper functioning of our kidneys, okay? So they all chip in here. This is another fat-soluble vitamin, okay? And it's critical in mineralizing bone, right? So this is what helps make our bones hard. If we have too little of it, when we're young, we have a condition called rickets, okay? Too much of this can cause a condition known as hypercalcemia, okay? And with hypercalcemia, we have convulsions, arrhythmia, tetany, um, and numbness, right? And that's not something that we want to see. So again, you can have toxic effects from too much of this, right? Um, in adults, a uh, deficiency of this is called osteomalacia, okay? So that's just the adult version of rickets. Sources are sunlight, cod liver oil, eggs, and enriched milk. And again, this is one of the reasons why you need to go out in the sun, not to the point where you run the risk of skin cancer, but you have to get enough sunshine to make that vitamin D, okay? So let's take a look at rickets. Hi, I'm Dr. Justin Davis, and today we're going to discuss a disease called rickets. 
Now, Ricketts describes when there is a vitamin D deficiency, and this leads to a weakening and malformation of the bones. There's two types of rickets. One is called a congenital rickets, where you're actually born with problems and can't have enough vitamin D. And the other is where you develop it simply because you don't have enough vitamin D in your diet or have no sun exposure because sun helps people to create vitamin D. So what happens when you don't have enough vitamin D? Well, vitamin D plays a very important part in your body's metabolism and use of phosphorus and calcium. And phosphorus and calcium are very important builders of bone. So without vitamin D, you won't have enough calcium and phosphorus. And without the calcium and phosphorus, they get pulled out of the bone and the bones end up becoming weakened. So symptoms of this, as you can imagine with weak bones, will be skeletal deformations. Often the hips or the legs will bow out. Sometimes you'll see um, the head softens a little bit, the, the skull of the head softens, and you maybe see a malformation of the skull bones. Um, spinal abnormalities are common. Um, people are often weak, and they may have dental abnormalities as well. Um, the good news is that when identified early, this is a very treatable condition. And further, it's very uncommon these days in the United States because most of our foods now are supplemented with vitamin D as well as calcium. As far as prevention goes, well, it's important if you know that a family member has congenital rickets that you screen very early on for this problem in a newborn. Otherwise, very few children will have rickets, but if you start noticing any kind of malformation such as a bowing of the legs, bring it to the attention of a doctor right away. Vitamin E is another fat soluble vitamin and it's an antioxidant. Okay, so what happens when organic molecules get oxidized is that their shape changes and their function goes away. Okay, they lose electrons as a result of this and that robs them of their normal function. Right, so this prevents that, prevents the oxidation of things like unsaturated fatty acids, <clears throat> and it helps preserve lung and red blood cell membranes. It's found in whole grains and vegetables. Recommended daily allowance is 10 milligrams. Deficiencies are hemolysis, edema, and anemia. Okay, now edema is swelling. Anemia is reduced number of red blood cells in the blood. Right. And so that cuts down on our oxygen carrying capability. Hemolysis is the rupturing of red blood cells. And that causes it causes them to release hemoglobin into the plasma. And that causes all kinds of problems. Right. That can cause conditions similar to what happens when you have what we call a transfusion reaction. And the result is that the hemoglobin blocks the capillary beds and all the tissues downstream of the block can die right? Very dangerous. Where do we get vitamin E? Meats, whole grains, vegetables, and vegetable oil. Okay? Vitamin K, we get from plants as a saturated side chain. That's K1. Vitamin K2 as an unsaturated side chain and is important for the synthesis of zymogens that are used in blood clotting. So just when you think vitamin K, think the ability to clot your blood, right? And that keeps you from bleeding to death, okay? Recommended daily allowance is 80 micrograms. Deficiencies are prolonged bleeding time and bruising. And we get it from liver and spinach and cauliflower and the bacteria that live in our colon right? They feed off of our fecal material and they generate vitamin K as a byproduct and we absorb that into the blood across the lining of the large intestine, okay? So too little vitamin K, too much bleeding, right? So those are the fat-soluble vitamins, right? A, D, E, and K, right? You can see what they do 
and you can see where they come from, right? Major sources. Again, this is from your textbook, right? And then you can see what happens if we have deficiencies, right? So this is another slide to star and study, all right? That's good test material right there. And remember with the fat soluble vitamins, you can, you can have a deficiency or toxicity. Either one, right? Because we have the ability to store this stuff in large quantities in the body, right? And I think I told you guys maybe a few stories about fat soluble molecules and why they're dangerous, right? They, they can go anywhere they want in the body, including into the brain, because there is no barrier to where they can diffuse, right? Examples of dangerous fat soluble things that we have come in contact with in the past include uh, lead and mercury and certain industrial dyes. Um, the, uh, the byproducts of um, burning coal, like diethylstilbestrone, which is a carcinogen, can pass right through the skin and get into the cells and can cause cancer, okay? Um, and the same is true with these vitamins, right? Vitamins and fat-soluble recreational drugs can be stored in the body for a long period of time. Um, the, uh, the fat soluble recreational drug LSD, which was a hallucinogen that was used a lot in the 60s, uh, was known to give flashbacks later in life because it would dissolve in the myelin in the brain. And then later it would sort of pop out of the myelin and exert its effects again. And so people would re-experience an LSD episode, even though they weren't actively taking the drug, right? So there's a lot of fat soluble compounds that you have to be careful about because they can go anywhere they want. This is why we don't have leaded gasoline or lead in paint anymore, right? It was because of the ability of the lead to seep into the nervous system and damage neurons in the way that they function, okay? So that actually is all I have for today, right? Talking about these vitamins. Um, I've sent you guys the homework and the notes, all right? So make sure and fill out that vitamin homework and get it back to me. I will have your, your exam scores up today, okay? Because I expect that last student to take the exam today and then I can post everything. You can see how you did. And then, um, Part of what we'll do next week is we'll go through um, some of those questions and uh, talk about, you know, what was missed and why. And remember that I'm offering you guys Friday tutoring by Zoom from five to seven every Friday. And I think I sent you guys the link for that. If you can't find it, let me know and I will send you that link again. And that's for you to come in with questions about either this course or anatomy or micro or whatever you're taking, okay? And I'll help you out with it, okay? Because I tutor all that stuff. So feel free. We have an exam next week. Your exam, let's look at the syllabus here. Your exam, let's do a share. Da, da, da. I was just saying, because I synced it on our calendar, it said we had an exam this week. Okay, so we are in, we are in, this is 211. So we are down, where's the 11th here? This is us, we're down here. Okay, so our next exam is going to be, let's see here. Where's that? Da, da, da. There's the exam two. Yeah. Yep. 
our next exam is going to be next week. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to send you a practice, okay? Uh, and then I'm going to, um, that'll have, again, a key associated with it. And then if you want to come to tutoring, we can talk about um, that information. Exam two is going to be over just stuff from week three through five. Okay. So I'll get that uh, practice out to you um, today. Okay. I'll send it out. Does anybody have any questions before we bump out? So when is the homework due by next Thursday? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And you've already sent it? Yep. It's in your email. Okay. Also, thank you. It's also in the chat. Okay. Find it in the chat and download it. Okay. okay. We good. Any other questions before we go? Okay. Did you get everybody for attendance? I did. Okay. Mm -hmm. I will see you guys next Thursday then. I thank you for coming. All right. Have a good week. You too. Thank you. Thank you.